So I'm just going to go through a few things. I'm going to focus a little bit more on sort of some of the technologies that we're pushing together, because that's what we are good at. Um, but I also want to cover some of the stuff that we've done in the severely ill patient study. Uh, the major reason to do that study is twofold. One is it's never been done before. And the second one is, uh, I, I mean, it have never been done before because it's hard. And uh, they don't go to doctors. And so what are they like? And so that was one of the reasons uh, really to do it. The other reason was the fact that whatever is wrong in this disease probably is, uh, is elevated in these patients and exaggerated. And so it might be a little easier to see maybe what's wrong. Um, so, so for our approach uh, uh, for this disease uh, is we really uh, asked the first question, is it a molecular disease? And that was one of the first things we wanted to try to figure out. Uh, to address that, um, we, we, we wanted to look at the uh, metabolomics and the immunological and the genomics data. That will tell us an awful lot whether it was, a, uh, it was really a molecular disease. Um, we also um, wanted to take a very systematic approach. And uh, the nice thing about some of the latest technologies, and most of this happened in, because of the Genome Project, the Genome Project uh, taught us that you can take on a big project and you can collect an awful lot of data. And that's actually much more cost effective. So what you have to look at how most, uh, I was on the IOM panel where we uh, looked at all the publications. And largely what happened, and there's 9,000 of them. So well, you said, wow, there's gonna be a lot of data. No, there was not very much data. And it was because there was no NIH support or CDC support. It's all happening in doctor's offices. And they would do 20 of their patients. And of course, they would use some patients probably for controls. And they would measure one thing. And at that rate, it's going to take us forever. So another way to do this is you get the same 20 patients, and you measure everything you can possibly measure. And it's basically saying, let's do all the experiments all, all at once. And now, you don't have to do the experiment anymore. You can go look it up, and that's kind of the plan. And then, of course, getting other people to do the same sort of thing. And of course, what you absolutely have to have is confirmation. You have to have multiple people doing the same thing. And uh, that's frowned upon. It's frowned upon by NIH. It's frowned upon by the journals. Uh, it's already been published. We don't, you don't get to publish it. You have to have confirmation. So uh, we also wanted to look. Uh, for genetic risk factors. Um, I don't think this is a genetic disease because most of the patients look pretty fine until they get sick. And, uh, and then they stay that way. It doesn't fit with how genetics generally works. And so, um, but it doesn't tell you that there may be genetic components that puts them at risk for getting it. And that would be very useful because it'll also tell you a little bit about what's going on uh, with the disease. And of course, what we'd love to have is a, is a biomarker. And the any main reason to get a biomarker is so that we can make other people believe that it exists. <laughs> uh, and, you ha and that's something that would be very important, and it also would help doctors. Uh, I don't think this disease is that difficult to diagnose, but uh, if you had a measurement, uh, a, an instrument that said it, uh, uh, they would believe it more. And there are still doctors that don't b that believe this disease doesn't exist. And then the, the thing that we have to constantly keep in mind uh, and always come back to, can we figure out a treatment? Uh, we want a treatment uh, and we'd also like to have a cure. And we have to constantly think about that when we do our research. So, uh, uh, I've been working in the, the Stanford Genome Technology Center for, we set it up about 30 years ago now, and we put out an awful lot of technology. Uh, out of those technology, we've set up 34 companies. Uh, we do a company, uh, one or two companies every year. 
and surprisingly, everyone has been successful. And that's because we make sure it works before we launch the company. Uh, so we develop lots of novel things, and the way we do that is we look to see what's needed, and it can't be done, and then we figure out how to do it. Um, the other thing that we would like to try to do uh, is worry about cost. And uh, I've had a big grant for a long time. Uh, we've changed the focus of that grant to uh, try to reduce the cost of health care. Uh, that grant has now been terminated because NIH says that reducing the cost of health care is not a priority. And I'm not going to keep silent about the stupidity of that comment. Uh, however, uh, uh, it, it isn't a priority for the NIH, but it's actually a priority for a lot of other people. So we have teamed up with Intermountain West Healthcare System where they believe that it is a priority and now they're funding some of our technology development, which we will then send to them um, and, and try this out that we will really save cost. So the other thing is that we really want to do a, uh, uh, establish what's called a precision medicine. Now, a, a lot of people think in order to do a study, you need to have three or 400 patients. Well, that's true if you're looking for a tiny signal. If you're trying to figure out what's wrong, I don't think you need that. And in fact, the precision medicine says we want to figure out what's wrong with this one patient. And we have to work a, a way in which we can an, an, analyze one patient and understand that one patient. That's going to be really hard, but, but that's what we have to do. And uh, uh, so a lot of our efforts is, is really to do that. So. Um, what we know about uh, MECFS is that there's a, there's a lot of genetics probably there, there's immunology, um, there's metabolism, and you've heard some, ex some excellent talks about that. We know that it's triggered by infection. Uh, we know there's an awful lot of symptoms. And, and those are what is, is, is at play uh, for when we try to analyze it. So in the big data study, uh, we've only taken 20 uh, severely ill patients they don't come to the clinic because they can't. We have to go to them. We also don't want to pester them with multiple sampling, so we had to agree to, take, to come to them once and take all the samples. That created a real dilemma for us in the sense that the amount of blood we can take was limited, and we have to do everything with that limited blood. And the hard part of that study was that we only had enough sample to do one test once. If we failed, we wouldn't get the data because we don't have a reserve supply. And that's really hard, because you don't really rely on that. Um, but uh, there are uh, a lot of things that we've measured, and I'm just putting up the list of things. I don't need to, um, I don't want to go through all those, but just show you we're doing a lot of things. Some of them we have not yet done in those samples, because uh, we don't have an awful lot of people, uh, because we don't have an awful lot of money. <laughs> But we're doing them, and they're archived, they're minus 80 frozen in our lab, and we're going to try to get to them. <coughs> now, um, I just want to go through some things uh, uh, kind of quickly about some of the things we've, we've seen. Uh, Wen Zong give you a few things, uh, but I wanted to cover uh, some hypotheses and just show you how we can sort of rule them out. Uh, one of the concerns is the fact that maybe these patients are suffering so much because they have a lot of DNA in their blood. That's, you see that in, tra in, in cancer patients, you see that in trauma patients, and it's very possible that DNA is a signal for fatigue. Because when you look at fatigue, uh, invariably they have a lot of DNA in the blood. And so we analyzed the, um, the, the, the uh, DNA that was found in the blood and compared to controls, Two patients have a little bit, but a, but a trauma patient or a cancer patient would have uh, much, much more than that. So I don't think DNA in the blood from looking at this analysis, these are severe patients, it ought to be off scale. Uh, having DNA in the blood is not providing a signal. So it's not the same signal that is found in trauma uh, and, and, or in cancer that might actually be initiating the fatigue, something else. So now, we don't have to look at that anymore. <laughs> That's what you're trying to do in these things is even eliminate things. 
And if you, if you have pretty good data, you don't have to do the experiment again. Uh, the other kind of things that we've been uh, looking at uh, is vi viruses. And uh, uh, this is the list of viruses we've looked at so far. I don't need to go through that extensively. Uh, we don't basically find viruses. And that's always been a hypothesis for people, that there's a virus that's causing this. So this is in the blood. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we, can, we, we don't have a very big sample. So we have a sample to do it once for all of them. So we had to work out a way in which we could test for all viruses in one test. And uh, uh, one of our scientists is really good at doing this. Uh, uh, Padang Shen developed that. And, uh, and what we see is that there's the amount, we only see two different viruses, EBV and HHV7, but the amount of them is actually less than in the controls because a lot of people have these. So I don't think that these viruses are contributing a great deal. Some of these viruses might be in some other location of the body that we can't get to. And so that is a, that's certainly possible, but it's not in the blood. The other thing is that, well, maybe uh, they have fewer mitochondria. We've certainly heard about this. If they have fewer mitochondria, they'll have less ability to make energy. So, so um, uh, the way to calibrate that is to look at the ratio of nuclear DNA to the, the mitochondrial DNA because that's a fixed, the nuclear DNA is fixed, so you can measure that. And the ratio is the same uh, for uh, patients and controls. So it looks to us that the, 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 amount, the number of mitochondria that they have uh, is probably the same. A, that's a little bit sophisticated, difficult thing to actually analyze. It could be done in different ways to do the same thing. Um, so, um, so that doesn't look like it's probably a, 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 a very big issue. Uh, of course, we also measure cytokines. It's actually quite easy today. There's an instrument here. Uh, Mark Davis has set up something called the Immune Monitoring Core. Uh, it's located really near our labs. Uh, and it's all set up where the instruments are there. You just sign up for them and use them. So we have a great facility for doing that. And uh, the, the, uh, here's this, this is just a plot of way we can kind of look at it. And uh, what you, the take-home lesson there is that uh, they, they do go up as the severity goes up. You can also do this over time, and that's actually something more useful to do what happens as a function of time and what happens as a function of symptoms. If symptoms get worse, the uh, cytokines are higher. So it probably accounts for some of the, the, the bad feelings that patients have. What's causing that is what we would like to get at. And, um, the, the, and it might be the stuff that Mark Davis talked about. Uh, it could be other things. Uh, we also look at uh, the metabolism, and we heard a lot from uh, Dr. Navio. Uh, but what we have to figure out is a way that we can easily look at all this data. And that's always been a problem. If you make tables and stuff of that type, uh, it's really hard to sort of sort out. You can if you write algorithms and programs to help you. Um, but we did a, a, we do a visual display of that. And uh, this is the metabolism of one of the severe patients. And we color code it. Uh, and that's, this is all the pathways. And we simply color code it with uh, uh, blue is low and red is high, and that allows you to zero in in an area of, and you just look for color. Uh, humans are very good at finding patterns. A lot of evolutionary selection, you know, is, is there a lion behind that bush? <laughs> uh, that, that provides a great selection. And if you can't spot the lion, you're likely to be dead. And so uh, we're very good at recognizing patterns, but not so rec good at recognizing numbers. And so you probably put it into a pattern so you can very quickly look at a tremendous amount of data and find the answer quickly. Now, <clears throat> uh, the other kinds of things that we're trying to do is to, is to try to devise uh, instruments. I'm going to show you a few things about the instrumentation. Uh, one of them we've been working on for a while um, is, is something that's wearable, but at the biochemical level. So uh, this, is a, this is a wearable um, uh, biosensing device. Uh, right now it measures lactate, glucose, sodium, and potassium, and it measures the femme sweat. So it's non-invasive. Now the difficulty, and it's definitely a difficulty with chronic fatigue syndrome, 
they don't exercise enough to sweat. So they would make it useless. However, uh, we do everything with electricity. So we figured out a way, in fact, to induce sweat by electricity. Uh, and as I told people, it's not, uh, we don't use a cattle prod. Uh, it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not that much electricity. <laughs> it's just enough to drive in uh, uh, chemicals that will induce the sweat, and then we can measure it. So we're trying to see if sweat is a very useful way to analyze how the patient is, uh, and we don't have to do something invasive. Um, and it looks like it's a, it, it's, it's a good candidate. Now we're doing the next step, uh, and this is something funded by Intermountain West Healthcare because of uh, NIH not wanting to do it, uh, uh, looking other for cytokines and biomarkers and other kinds of things that actually might be useful to the patient and do it in real time. So this, this device uh, has Bluetooth on it. It will communicate with your phone, um, and, and it can tell you what's going on. What we'd like to do is increase the number of things we, we can measure. Now, <clears throat> sort of the next um, phase for this is that we realize we probably have to go internal for some things. So we are trying to devise ways that we can implant something that will be in contact with the blood. Now, that can't be invasive. Uh, it's, so the best way to do it is to make it very small. It also needs power. And so we said, the, and we would like the power to last for a long time. So our goal would be have a power generator that would last for at least 30 years. So you don't have to replace it. And so the, instead of a battery or anything of that type, we decided to make an electric generator. And, that, and so that electric generator uh, is uh, placed on anything that moves, a muscle, an artery, the heart, and it will generate electrical power. And that's already been built. It's, and uh, uh, now the thing is to make it small. So I can't show it to you because you can't see it. <laughs> it's too small. <laughs> uh, it's about the size of a cell. And it will ge generate two volts. And so that will be then to drive all the measuring devices, and then that we'll, we'll figure out a way to communicate. I don't know if it's going to be Bluetooth. Bluetooth is simple, but it might be some other way to transmit the data out of the body and into your phone, and then maybe give you some early warnings. So one of our goals is to try, to try to devise a way to tell us when we're getting sick before you're contagious. And that's going to be absolutely essential in our next big epidemic, which is a matter of when. It's kind of like living in California. When's the earthquake going to happen, the big one? The next epidemic might be sooner. <laughs> and that'll be a disaster. So the other kinds of things we're, tr we're doing with, uh, in this project uh, is to um, make uh, pluripotent stem cells from the, all the patients. And so this generates a cell line, which we then can generate all the other tissues. So if there are genetic components of this disease, and we want to look at neurons, we don't have to do brain biopsies. <laughs> we can simply generate the neurons in the lab, and we can generate muscle cells. We can generate any type liver cells. We can generate any of the cells, and then we can analyze them in the laboratory. And so this will, this will help us not have to do invasive procedures in patients. Now I want to turn to another device that, um, and, and uh, I th this device I think is, uh, it, it maybe illustrate innovation. And to do innovation, uh, you have to, so don't say what I do when you do an experiment, is that you propose an experiment and you don't know the answer. When you do innovation, you don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> so the experiment is, does it work or not? <laughs> And so um, I'm going to show you a device that we've built, and it's called a nano needle. And uh, up on the upper uh, uh, right on the screen is uh, is a, a diagram showing what it looks like. I can't pull you up one out because it's also too small to see. Um, so um, this is a little bit bigger than a molecule. And so uh, uh, the the electrodes. There's two electrodes that come in. Uh, into a trough. That trough is a, is a, is a micro trough. Uh, it can hold blood. And then it's uh, two electrodes come in and they're made of gold. Uh, it doesn't cost much because the amount of gold there is tiny. And uh, 
uh, but it can measure uh, electrical properties, and what we measure is electrical impedance. And uh, that is a, gives us a lot of information about the sample. And what we've discovered with this device is if we put uh, a culture of bacteria into the channel and measure the impedance, and then we put in an antibiotic that would kill the bacteria, the impedance will change. And that's because the cell, the cell behavior and morphology changes. If the bacteria are resistant to the antibiotic, it, does, it doesn't change. So we don't need to see if the cells can grow. That's the normal assay for, for uh, resistance. We simply measure the electrical impedance can tell whether it's going to kill it or not. And, and this is a way we hopefully we can do something very fast. And this is something else we're doing with Intermountain West Healthcare to diagnose uh, a sepsis at a much earlier stage and not only identify that it's existing, but what antibiotic we should be using. And now we can go to inexpensive antibiotics that happen to work on this infection. And so we don't have to always use the most potent antibiotic, and that will help antibiotic resistance. The other thing we found is that we put a tumor cell in, or, or blood containing tumor cells, and we can measure impedance, and we put in an anti-tumor agent. If it doesn't change impedance, don't use that agent. We have to use one that will change the impedance. So if we do this, so we said, okay, this is working great. What happens when we put in blood cells from chronic fatigue syndrome patients? We put them in, we don't see any difference. Well, we're not making any demands on the cell. And some of the problem, of course, with the patients is if you put demand on them, they can't deal with it. So let's do the same thing to the cells. Let's put a demand on them. And so the demand is put in sodium chloride, real simple. And sodium chloride can't be tolerated in cells, at least not much of it, and they pump it out. In order to pump it out, it uses energy. So you're stressing them. And when you do that, uh, when you do that stress, uh, what you find is that uh, healthy cells handled it fine, but cells, uh, blood cells from MECFS, the white cells, uh, increase tremendously in impedance. This is incredibly reproducible. If you do this, we've done it multiple times with same patients. Uh, we've done multiple patients. We've done severe patients. We've done not severe patients. We get the same result. Uh, we've done a large number of now of healthy people, and, and they never show it. Problem is, we have no idea why. <laughs> so we said, well, maybe we're depleting the energy supply of the cell. That would make sense. So we put in, we try to bypass that uh, and put in lots of pyruvate, which should provide more energy. And it bypasses glycolysis, and you heard some talks with the metabolomics that maybe glycolysis might be brought, and that bypasses it and should give energy. And it goes away. That fits the, that, that fits the hypothesis. Uh, and so we've done a number of other additions. Uh, we've added cerumen because Dr. Navio said that might work. Uh, it, it really does reduce it, and uh, we're going to repeat those experiments. I think we need to put the serum in for a longer period of time to see what happens, and uh, that's encouraging. The signal doesn't completely go away, but it's greatly reduced. So um, this could turn into a, 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 a simple test. Uh, the cost of the chip uh, is under a dollar. Um, so it's not an expensive test. There's no other reagents that you need. It's electricity. That's what we do to electricity. Electricity is cheap. <clears throat> so um, so I can show you another experiment that's been done, and that is uh, we've always assumed that it's in the cell. And the question is, but well, you need to do the experiment. <laughs> Are the cells defective in some way? So we've, went, but we've done what's called a serum switch. Because what's, what's in that channel is the cells and their plasma from the blood. And if we switch it, it, tr it, um, it tracks with the plasma, not the cell. So if you put in plasma from a healthy patient, the CFS cells become normal. And if you take plasma from a CFS patient and put it on healthy cells, they look like CFS cells. Oops. 
So I want to show I want to show you one more thing. So th 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 that's an important thing because an awful lot of experiments people are doing, say with this, the CR sensor, it's very common. A lot of stuff is done here at Stanford. First thing you do is you think it's in the cell, so you take the cells, you isolate the cells, and then you put them into some kind of synthetic media, and then you find that hey, they look okay, the cells are fine. Yes, but are they fine in the blood? <laughs> And so you gotta, you got to sometimes keep them in their own plasma and see what they do. We don't know what the factor is. It's, it's high molecular weight, because it, it, when we try to filter it, it's, it, it gets filtered out. Uh, it might be an antibody, might be something else. We don't know what it is yet. But the nice thing, this is simple biochemistry. <laughs> we can figure it out. Uh, we have one more thing that I, uh, whoops, I will show you. Uh, um, and, and that's another little device uh, that was made by one of the engineering people. Um, and uh, uh, it's something that goes onto the iPhone. It's basically a microscope that allows you to look at cells. And if you, um, uh, you look at cells um, with this device, you can find, and I'm not, I'm not going to go through all the data, uh, you, can also, you can find that uh, the, the, the white cells are light. The, the white cells must have different metabolites in them that changes their density. This could be a, a, part, a part of a diagnostic test. Interesting thing is that what we put on here are some incidents of fever uh, which occurred in this one patient um, with, because of a bacterial infection and it, and it greatly shifted uh, the density and it made them more normal. And the correlation is that the fever caused the patient to be, feel much better. So there is a connection there too. I want to show you one, one last thing here on the technology front, um, and that's we keep trying to reduce the cost. Uh, this is a little cell sorter, and there's a coin there to give you an idea of size. Um, a fluorescence activated cell sorter, we use them at Stanford, cost about $150,000. Uh, we can sort cells with this device using purely electricity and electrical circuits and the device is printed onto a piece of sh thin plastic using, and all the electronics is also printed with an pr inkjet printer using silver nanoparticles. And so we can print the instrument on a standard 2D printer that cost a few hundred dollars. The cost of the ink and the plastic is one cent. And it's, and it's reusable. And so we're trying to build this into electrical devices. The neat thing about it, we can, do, we can design all of the circuitry in our lab. We can email it to somebody in Africa and they can print the instrument. And so this, we're trying to do things that will transform uh, medicine and at the same time solve MECFS. But I wanted to add, uh, one, one last thing here, um, and, and that is that we really, uh, really need to have the cooperation and, and, and it's, uh, uh, of the community. And I must say, it's been phenomenal. When we've asked patients, could you come in and give us a blood sample, uh, they always say yes. And now we've learned that we have to be very careful because they may do it at a great ex difficulty for themselves. Uh, the, the community has been phenomenal in helping and participating. We get volunteers to come in and help us, um, and uh, I've been really, really, really impressed with how much, in fact, one of the researchers uh, has MECFS. Um, so the community has been fantastic. Um, I, I, just sort of in conclusion, um, we really want to bring a new understanding and treatment options for this disease. And I want to, I want to emphasize treatment. I mean, that, that is the, the sort of our, our holy grail there is a, a cure, but we'll take treatment. And, and we constantly think about when we find a result, is that, what does that mean for treatment? So it's not just about publication. Um, we do know that it's a molecular disease. Uh, people who now say that it's not are a fool. Um, and there's a lot, and they're they are totally ignoring reality, and uh, you can call them a fool. You have my permission. Uh, 
Uh, we also really want to make uh, partnerships. Uh, and this is not a, a, a disease that can be solved by, I think, one individual, although people would like to do it by themselves. I think it needs a community and it needs a lots of different expertise. So our whole focus is to be data and technology driven to try to unravel this. And I will work with anybody um, to do this. And uh, I really uh, appreciate everybody coming here. For many of you, it's been extremely difficult to do. I hope it's been useful. Uh, th this initially started with uh, signing a scientific meeting and getting people together, and then we realized, because uh, a lot of people were asking about it, they would like to participate. But we can't have patients participating when we talk about and have these knock out, drag out fights about the data, <laughs> right? Um, th they will misunderstand. They'll think we hate each other. We do not hate each other. We just, we just want the right answer. And so uh, it'll be misunderstood if you, if you listen to our scientific discussion. So we have to then come here and tell you what we are pretty sure is right. And, uh, and I hope that that has been useful and we need to think about whether we should do this again. Thank you very much.